Hi there, Chloe. Taking a little break between classes? Yeah. I needed one after that last class. Oh? What happened? We had a heated debate today on the definition of what is a game, or to be more precise, what makes a game a game. I see. I bet that was a pretty good debate. Wish I was there to see it. All I took from it was that nobody could come to an agreement about what makes a game a game. Back in the early days of video games nobody really knew what made a good game, so the definitions were very narrow. As time went by, those definitions changed. Today, we live in a special time, because we're seeing yet another gaming renaissance. The definitions of what makes something a game are changing, and we're getting all manner of new and exciting ideas. One guy gave an example of everyone's gone to the rapture as a game that isn't really a game. I can almost guarantee he was a console gamer. Yeah, this guy's borderline fanboy when it comes to the PS4. I hate to say this, but the console industry is to blame for such narrow-minded opinions. I'm not surprised. It was very different in the infancy of the video game era. Nobody knew what made a good video game, so everyone was trying different ideas. As video game popularity grew, a new breed of game developer surfaced. One who wanted to cash in on the gaming craze. Meanwhile, all kinds of new innovative ideas were being tried. Atari had the Sword Quest series. They were a part of a contest where you could win prizes made of gold, silver, and precious gems worth more than $10,000 each. I saw the angry video game nerd episode about that. Then, you know the final game in the Sword Quest series was never released, and the content never finished because of the video game crash. Those developers wanting to cash in on the popularity of games created the perfect conditions to cause the crash, and the failure of Atari ZT became the trigger. Video games would survive on computers, and that's where game genres saw a renaissance new innovation. I read about that era. There were computers like the Apple II series, the Commodore 64, and even Atari had home computers. Yes, and there were a lot of competing computer formats. Eventually, it came down to Apple and IBM. On one side you had IBM MS-DOS PCs which were becoming a popular platform for games, and you had Apple which were well established as a premier gaming platform. Unfortunately, some execs at Apple wanted to focus on the enterprise rather than home computing. They kicked Steve Jobs out. That was a mistake, one they've never recovered from even after Steve Jobs returned. So, that's why Windows dominates in PC gaming today. Yes. Meanwhile, Nintendo arrived and resurrected the game console market. Another new wave of gaming evolution happened. However, by the end of the 8-bit era the console market was already starting to limit itself to just a few genre. The 16-bit era brought better graphics and sound, but there really wasn't all that much real innovation in gameplay. Just variations on old ideas. PCs, however, were a different story. Consoles have limited input methods because of their controllers. This was very limited during the Atari 2600 era. PCs, on the other hand, had the keyboard and mouse. This allowed for complex controls, and thus allowed for more innovation in gameplay styles. This gave rise to all manner of different genre which couldn't be done easily on a console with limited gamepad controls. As consoles continued to advance into the 32-bit era the genre they supported were limited to fighters, RPGs, platformers, first-person shooters, sports, horror, third-person adventures, and racing games. There were a few exceptions, but those main genre became the most popular. So developers saw little incentive in taking risks on something totally new. But, didn't that era see the rise of games like Final Fantasy VII? For JRPGs Final Fantasy VII was a major leap forward when it came to graphics and presentation, but under the hood the game still worked like previous Final Fantasy games. The seeds for the stagnation of the console industry were sown, but we wouldn't see it start to bloom until the PS3 and Xbox 360 era. I have a feeling I know where this is going. I talk about the AAA studios and how they've stagnated and become too dependent on annual franchises because they remind me so much of what caused the first video game crash. It was a glut of bad games and then one high profile failure that killed console gaming, until the NES brought it back to life. You can see that the parallels are quite disturbing. What about this current generation? 
Yes, this generation is a bit different. The PS3 and 360 era saw the appearance of indie studios. Today, indie studios are maturing and starting to release AAA quality games for new genre, and much needed innovation to old ones. Some are even defying the norms of what is considered a game. Titles like The Stanley Parable, The Graveyard, Dear Esther, Everyone's Gone to the Rapture, and etc. are all examples of these radical new ideas. But, aren't a few of those just variations on the existing genre? Fundamentally, yes. However what they bring to those genre are new ideas that defy accepted norms, then you have games like No Man's Sky, Astro Near, and Star Citizen which attempt to combine multiple genre to create a new ones which have never been attempted before. You have games which are intended to be moving works of art. Games like, That Dragon Cancer, which educate while they entertain and really impact the player emotionally. I see, so that's the kind of innovation you're talking about. Yes, and this is what's different about the gaming industry today as opposed to what it was like back in 1983. You see, these new kinds of games are entering the gaming consciousness, and in time the limited genre set which consoles have been stuck in for so long will change. I'm hoping it doesn't take another crash to make that happen. But that's up to the AAAs and whether they're willing or capable of changing their ways. Call of Duty and Battlefield fanboys will be a minority someday probably much sooner than anyone believes. Franchise fatigue is a real thing, and we're starting to see it with both games. It is only a matter of time before it reaches critical mass. And the fanboys will scream and holler even louder. Let them. The state the AAA studios are in is mostly their fault. They are why the AAAs are milking their franchises to death. It's really not much different from mobile games exploiting whales. Fanboys are addicted to a certain franchise, so they keep buying it which keeps the vicious cycle going. Slowly, more and more of them are seeing the light. They're seeing how these big franchises have stagnated, and are starting to demand either change or something new. That something new is already here, but it isn't coming from the AAA studios. Precisely. In fact, I promise you in time the AAAs will try to release a game that tries to look like one of these new ideas, but they'll completely miss the whole point of what makes these new concepts work. They'll fall flat on their faces. Out of necessity they'll be forced for the first time to actually change. Whether they succeed or fail will depend on how willingly they are to let go of that status quo. Those that can't let go will fall. Those that do may have a chance. So, overall, the definition of what is a game is evolving. Correct. A game doesn't have to have gunplay or fighting to be a game. Look at Undertale, you can win the game by befriending everyone you meet rather than killing them. This is what I'm talking about. There will be pushback by those who are too emotionally invested in games that scratch that empowerment fantasy itch, and I'm not saying those kinds of games will go away, just that there will be new kinds of mainstream games where you don't shoot people in the face. Games that make you think, or touch you emotionally, or simply exist to wonder, and dazzle the mind. New developers with radical new ideas now have access to free tools to make games which used to be too expensive for one person to afford. They will be the Picassos, the Van Goghs, and the Michelangelos of gaming. We're on the cusp of a second video game golden age. However, I can't see that happening without the collapse of the status quo. It doesn't mean games like Call of Duty will go away entirely, but they won't dominate the gaming consciousness like they do now. So. The craziness we're seeing in the gaming industry are simply growing pains, right? Pretty much. Games are becoming a lot more like movies, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, the danger is the tendency to keep repeating the same thing that worked the first time without really understanding why it worked. That's why the AAA studios are stagnating. Why most of them aren't taking risks on new IPs. Hollywood is the same way. Look at the success of Deadpool. Now it looks like the movie studios are going to double down on R-rated superhero movies. They've totally missed why Deadpool worked, and why most of the X-Men movies and the new Fantastic Four film didn't work. Deadpool worked because the movie stayed very close to the source material. The X-Men movies and Fantastic Four changed the formula too much. We're getting off topic, but you are right. That's why those movies failed, and Deadpool worked. 
it is a failure to understand what made them work or not work, and this is what the AAA studios need to learn, rather than double down on what worked and just keep releasing small variations on that formula, they need to see how they can improve upon the formula while still staying true to the spirit of the original. This is why Batman Arkham Asylum and Arkham City worked so well, why Arkham Origins wasn't well received, and why Arkham Knight got such a mixed response. That crappy PC port and using Nvidia game works didn't help matters any. That's true. When you go back to that class tomorrow, why not bring up what we discussed today? We touched on a lot of things, but the main theme was that the definition of what makes a game a game is evolving. I think I'll do that, Professor. It might open a few eyes. I'm glad this little chat helped. We come to the end of our three-part series on the future of gaming. We hope you enjoyed the show, and that you also took something from it. New creative minds are changing the shape of the video games in ways we've never seen before. The future of gaming looks bright, assuming we can learn from the mistakes of the past. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.